My name is Martin Anthony. I'm the, the head of the mathematics department here at LSE. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to this talk, Game Theory Through the Computational Lens. Um, this event is hosted by the maths department at LSE, and I'm grateful to the LSE Public Lectures Program and to our very own Rebecca Lum for their help in organizing it. Um, no, uh, just a bit of housekeeping, no, no fire alarm drill is planned, so if an alarm does go off, it's for real and we should uh, decorously follow the stewards out of the building. Um, the lecture is being recorded and um, it's hoped that we will have a podcast available soon on LSE's website. Um, so please uh, put your mobiles on silent, but uh, no need to turn them off uh, because we hope that you will be tweeting and the hashtag is hashtag LSE maths. Today's speaker is Professor Tim Roughgarden. Tim will speak for about 60 minutes, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. <laughs> a graduate of Stanford and Cornell, Tim is professor in computer science and management science and engineering at Stanford University. He's renowned for his work in theoretical computer science and game theory, and particularly the connections of those with economics, and for his work in the design and analysis of algorithms generally. Among his very many awards, which Tim was too embarrassed for me to enumerate in full, uh, he's won the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the Gödel Prize, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Tim is also, I'm very pleased to say, uh, a visiting professor in the mathematics department here at LSE and is spending a sabbatical year here based in our department. Tim's well known, apart from his research, for his exposition of algorithms, both through MOOCs and YouTube, and his books. He's the author of 20 lectures on algorithmic game theory and Algorithms Illuminated. And uh, these will be available to purchase outside the lecture room later, and Tim will be very happy to sign copies and to meet with you after the lecture. So please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming. Tim Roughgarden. How's the sound? Is the sound okay? Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Martin, for the kind introduction. Also to LSE Maths for hosting my visit this year. Um, so good evening. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, my goal tonight is to introduce you to a few of the many contacts between computer science, especially theoretical computer science, and game theory. So what do computer science and game theory have to do with each other? Well, let's start at the beginning. The beginning's in the first half of the 20th century. That's when uh, both of their fields have their origins. And actually, a single individual was totally crucial in the early development of both of these, namely John von Neumann, widely considered one of the most important mathematicians of the 20th century. So already in the 1920s, von Neumann had laid much of the groundwork for game theory, uh, although the field would only really sort of go viral uh, when he wrote a book with Oscar Morgenstern, published in 1944. And kind of amazingly, just a year or two after that, he was involved in the construction of some of the world's first ever general purpose computing devices, first as a consultant on the ENIAC machine, uh, then leading an effort at the Institute for Advanced Studies. So it's a pretty impressive CV. There's also lots of stuff I haven't put on this slide. So you may have heard of von Neumann for one of these reasons. If he seems sort of like a familiar character, but you can't quite remember why, it can also be because the titular character of Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove is actually based in part on John von Neumann. True story. So von Neumann had some common motivations for these two lines of work, specifically military strategy and technology. But uh, as far as I know, in his career, he didn't really join them in any way. Okay? He worked on them independently. And indeed, as the 20th century unfolded, computer science and game theory, uh, you know, really took their sort of uh, parallel tracks and didn't communicate with each other very much. And that's a big contrast with the 21st century when there's been a really lively conversation going on between computer science and economics, which I'm going to tell you about. But before we fast forward to the 21st century, let's spend a little more time in the 20th and talk about one revolutionary idea from each of these two fields. 
So let's start with game theory and the concept of a Nash equilibrium. So in 1950, John Nash proved a truly remarkable result. What he showed is that in any strategic situation whatsoever, also called the game, and it doesn't matter how many actors are in this strategic situation, it doesn't matter what they can do or what they want, always there's going to be at least one, what Nash called an equilibrium point, what we today would call a Nash equilibrium. So this, in some sense, gave game theorists and economic analysts everything they could possibly want, a universal guarantee of existence. Knowing nothing whatsoever about the details of the strategic situation you care about, you can rest assured that there's at least one equilibrium that you can use to reason about that situation. Okay? So what is an equilibrium exactly? Uh, well, you probably have a strong and intuitive sense of what an equilibrium is. Right? You have a bunch of actors, and an equilibrium is where all, none of them want to move. All of them are happy, given what everybody else is doing. I hope you don't think you know what a Nash equilibrium is just from watching the movie A Beautiful Mind, because the key scene in that movie that discusses the Nash equilibrium actually gets it completely wrong. So if you ever saw that, please erase that from your memory. So to get a stronger sense for Nash equilibria, it's useful to look at examples. Consider, for example, the game of chicken. Two drivers are driving against each other at full speed. Each can either chicken out and swerve or continue barreling forward and going straight. And the goal in the chicken game is you don't want to get into an accident, but you want the reason to be because the other player chickened out. You want to go straight while they swerve. So we can illustrate that situation with a two by two matrix. The rows here correspond to the two actions available to the first driver, the two columns to those of the second driver. And each entry of the matrix has a pair of numbers. These are called payoffs, higher is better. These are the payoffs to the first and second driver respectively in that particular outcome of the game. So for example, if both of them go straight, they get into a collision and they both get negative payoff, that's bad. If one of them chickens out and the other one wins, then the winner gets one and whoever chickened out gets zero. Okay? So in this particular game, it's not hard to start identifying equilibrium points in the sense of Nash. For example, if the first driver chickens out and the second one goes straight, that's going to be a Nash equilibrium. Certainly the second driver is happy, they've won the game. But even the first driver, while not that excited about being the chicken, you know, the alternative, given what the other player is doing, is to go straight and get into an accident, and that would be even worse. There is, of course, a second equilibrium with the roles of the players reversed. Another familiar example would be the rock, paper, scissors game, okay, or Rochambeau. I think you all know the rules. Rock smashes scissors, scissors cuts paper, paper covers rock. We can again talk about this game as a matrix. Now three rows and three columns corresponding to the actions. If there's a draw, meaning both players pick the same strategy, the payoffs are zero. Otherwise, the winner gets a payoff of one and the loser a payoff of minus one. And perhaps this game should puzzle you, or you, the interpretation of Nash's theorem should puzzle you. Because unlike in the game of chicken, none of these nine entries in this matrix constitute an equilibrium. At least one player would want to switch from any one of these outcomes. For example, if the row player picked scissors and the column player picked rock, the row player would be unhappy. They're currently losing, but if the row player switched to play paper, then they would all of a sudden be winning the game. So where is this alleged promised equilibrium? Well, here's the twist, and this is something you should know about Nash equilibria, which is that players are allowed to randomize. So a player is permitted to flip coins in its mind and use the outcomes of those coin flips to figure out which of their actions to play. And once you allow players to randomize, now all of a sudden, the rock, paper, scissors game does have a Nash equilibrium, one in which each of the two players picks a strategy uniformly at random, equally likely. That's the reason, the reason being that that protects you, no matter what the other player does, you will always have an equal chance of winning or losing or tying. Okay? So the content of Nash's theorem is that the existence of this equilibrium point is not special to the chicken and the rock, paper, scissors game. It is totally universal. Okay? No matter how many dimensions your matrix has, no matter how big it is, 
No matter what numbers are inside, there's always a way for players to randomize so that nobody wants to switch to doing something else, given what everybody else is doing. So, game theory gives you some advice about how to play rock, paper, scissors. It suggests maybe you should consider, you know, flipping coins in your mind and picking one uniformly at random. Okay? That advice is sort of easier said than done. Turns out humans are really bad at flipping independent random coins in their head. And there's pretty much nowhere this is more painfully obvious than in the championships of rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> you did know, right, that there was a rock, paper, scissors championship, right? $50,000, top prize. If you've, if you've never seen it, I encourage you to look it up on YouTube, watch some clips. It's one of the best examples I know of of just pure psychological warfare between people. All right, so the last piece of advice I have for you with rock, paper, scissors, uh, it's really just common sense, frankly, which is never, ever enter a match with a robot hand equipped with a high-speed camera. You will always lose, guaranteed, okay? Incidentally, returning to the game of chicken and thinking about now allowing players to randomize, you actually pick up a third Nash equilibrium, in addition to the two we identified earlier, and it's one where the players randomize. Each one with 50-50 probability either goes straight or swerves. It's not a particularly attractive Nash equilibria. There's a one in four chance that there'll be a collision. And, you know, for many years, I was aware of this Nash equilibrium in the chicken game. I always thought it was weird. I was like, you'd never see this in real life. Then I moved here. <laughs> I started walking around central London. And in the last two months, I've become intimately familiar with this particular <laughs> Nash equilibrium. So moving from game theory to computer science and rewinding a little bit, back to the year 1936. That's the year Alan Turing wrote the paper which many computer scientists regard as the origin of our discipline. And for that reason, many of us think Alan Turing's name deserves to be as widely recognized as, say, Albert Einstein. So what makes Turing's paper so important? Well, two things. Number one, Turing proposed a formal model of computation. It's a model that we would now refer to as a Turing machine. That is, he gave a mathematical definition of what exactly general purpose computing devices were capable of. Now, mind you, this is the mid-30s. This is 10 years before anyone would actually build a general purpose computing device. So Turing gave us a theory of computing well before we even had computing in the sense that we know it today, which is pretty amazing. Second thing is that once you have a mathematical definition of what it is computers can do, you can start speaking about what they can't do. And in the same paper of Turing, he identified what are called undecidable problems. These are computational problems that will never, ever be solved in general by a computer. Doesn't matter if you get in a time machine and go a thousand years in the future. Computers will still not be able to, in general, solve these undecidable problems. Some of them are very concrete, like the halting problem. This just says, suppose I give you a piece of code. Let's call it a thousand lines of Python. I just want to know whether it's ever going to go into an infinite loop or whether it's eventually going to halt. That's an undecidable problem. You could, of course, try running the program and seeing what happens. Problem being, if it doesn't halt after 100 years, how do you know it's not going to halt tomorrow? And you might hope there'd be some smart shortcut to just sort of analyze the program and figure out what's going to happen. There isn't. Okay, that's what Turing theory, th Turing's theory tells us. This will never be possible. And if you've never encountered these undecidable problems before, uh, it may shock you a little bit. It's kind of remarkable. Because open the newspaper, right, you just hear about computers getting smarter, more powerful, more, you know, uh, faster. And so you might be thinking that eventually they'll be able to solve any task whatsoever. Okay, but since 1936, we have known that that is not the case. Okay, there will be always things that computers cannot do. So Nash's theorem I introduced as giving game theorists and e economists everything that they might want. But the experience for computer scientists has been quite different. Literally since day one of our discipline, we've been acutely aware that there will be things we were never able to do. 
problems that can never be solved by computer, so we won't always be able to get what we want. So I don't know what you think of when you think of Alan Turing. Me? I think of the Rolling Stones. So she's particularly appropriate to mention here at LSE in her song, <laughs> You Can't Always Get What You Want. So for the rest of the talk, the plan is to tell you about three case studies meant to illustrate 21st century research happening at the interface of these two fields, game theory and computer science. The first case study, it's in a model which is, you know, on the one hand, near and dear to my heart, but I think it still remains one of the most vivid illustrations of why, you know, computer scientists and game theorists really had to start talking to each other, okay? It was just totally inevitable. So this case study concerns a model of routing traffic through a network. Now, the reason computer scientists tend to care about routing a network is because of data flowing through communication networks. But for the purposes of this talk, I encourage you to think about something that you're probably all too familiar with, which is vehicular traffic uh, on roads as you're driving around. The principles are largely the same, okay? So let me introduce you to this model. And it's a very old model, almost 100 years old, discussed informally by A.C. Pigou in his 1920 book, The Economics of Welfare. Let me introduce it by example. So when I'm not on sabbatical in London, I live in San Francisco, California, and I work at Stanford. And it turns out there's two ways, two parallel highways that connect San Francisco to Stanford, Highway 101 and Highway 280. And if it's four in the morning, it's the middle of the night, you always want to take Highway 101. It's shorter, so you'll get there faster. In the middle of the day, it's less clear, because 101 is more prone to congestion and traffic jams. So on this slide, I'm showing you a caricature of that situation. S here representing San Francisco, T representing Stanford, and I'm showing you two parallel roads. Each of the roads is annotated with what I'm going to call a cost function, and that, that defines the travel time incurred by the traffic on that road as a function of the congestion, of the fraction X of the population that chooses to drive on that road. So the bottom road is meant to be Highway 280, and it just always takes an hour. Doesn't matter if it's empty, doesn't matter if it's full. The top road is meant to be Highway 101, where the delay in hours is equal to the fraction of traffic that chooses to use it. So if half the population drives on the top road, they get to T in 30 minutes. If everybody drives on the top road, it takes 60 minutes, a full hour. So what I want to do next <coughs> is ask two questions. Question one, is what do we expect to happen? So what do we think self-interested drivers are going to do, assuming naturally they want to get to T as quickly as possible? Question two is going to be a thought experiment. Hypothetically, if we could coordinate everybody's choices of routes, could we improve over the selfish solution? So let's look at the first question. Okay, so what is it that selfish drivers would do in Pigou's example? Well, actually, if you think about it, I've set it up so this is a really easy question. Okay, it's sort of a no-brainer from the driver perspective. You should always take the upper route. Reason being is that the worst case scenario on the top road is an hour, and that's as good as the best case scenario on the bottom route. route. So there's never a reason to take the bottom route. It's called a dominant strategy for players to take the top one. So at equilibrium, we expect everybody to be on Highway 101, the top route. It's fully congested. It takes them all 60 minutes to get to Stanford. Question two, could we do better if hypothetically we could control everybody's routes? Well, in fact, actually, if you think about it, almost anything would be better in Pigou's example. But if someone made you an altruistic dictator, what you'd want to do is split the traffic 50-50 between the two roads. Traffic on the bottom road, you know, it takes them an hour, so that's no better than before. But the traffic still on the top road now has a relatively uncongested ride. It takes them only 30 minutes to get to T, which means that the average commute time has dropped from 60 to 45, okay? So Pico's example teaches us something which, you know, probably we already knew intuitively, which is if you just let people do whatever they want, in general, you won't get an outcome as good as sort of the best one for society, you know, if you could just control everybody's actions. Um, good. The basic reason for that is because as a driver, when you choose a route, you're thinking only about your own delay. 
you're not thinking about the fact that your presence also increases the delay for everybody else that you're sharing the road with. Okay? Good. So, Kutsupius and Papadimitriou, in 1999, introduced the colorful concept of the price of anarchy to measure exactly what are the consequences of self-interested behavior. And it's defined just as the ratio in the quality of the equilibrium versus the quality you could attain with this thought experiment of full centralized control. So in Pigou's example, the price of anarchy by definition would be the equilibrium commute time of 60 divided by the best possible commute time of 45, also known as four-thirds. Okay? So the price of anarchy is four-thirds in Pigou's example. So Pigou's example is not the most famous example of this routing model. That distinction belongs to something known as Brace's paradox, which is nearing its 50th birthday. Okay? And this, this, is a, this is a nice example to know. This comes in handy at cocktail parties, at least at uh, sufficiently nerdy cocktail parties. <laughs> so we're again going to have an S and a T, and we're going to have two parallel routes. Now each of the routes will comprise two different roads, one version of 101 and one version of 280. So the 1 and the X mean the same thing that they did on the previous slide. Now because the two routes here are, are exactly the same, uh, you'd sort of expect drivers at equilibrium to load balance between them, split 50-50. That way the travel time along each of them would be 90 minutes. So that seems pretty boring. Right? It seems like there's no paradox. So the paradox comes in, you know, if, you know, next year at the TED 2018 conference, Elon Musk announces he just finished building a teleporter. And if we install one of those teleporters on the midpoint of the top route, allowing you to go instantaneously to the midpoint of the bottom route. That's this edge with cost zero, travel time zero. <coughs> so how is this going to affect what people do? Well, now it's a no-brainer to make use of the teleportation device, again, a dominant strategy. For example, you know, if everybody else is splitting half-half, anybody who zigzags will now have commute time 30 plus zero plus 30, or 60, okay, as opposed to the 90 they're experiencing now. Of course, you know, everybody's going to want to bandwagon and make use of the teleportation device. And once everybody does that, in their rush, they've congested the upper left and the lower right, ro uh, right roads. So they're now each fully congested, and they each take an hour, which means that in the new equilibrium, after we've installed the teleporter, the commute time has actually gone up. It used to be 90 minutes. You put in the teleporter, it becomes 120. So this is the paradox. You can make a network only better, and yet when you have self-interested behavior, the outcome can be worse for everybody. We can also talk about the price of anarchy in this network on the right. So the equilibrium commute time, as we saw, is 120 minutes. It turns out an altruistic dictator in the right network can't do any better than this red traffic pattern. You would just ignore the teleportation device. So the best possible commute time is 90 minutes. So the price of anarchy in Brace's paradox is 120 over 90, or 4 over 3. And we'll talk about that coincidence of the 4 over 3 shortly. Okay. So I don't want you to get the impression that Brace's paradox is just some strange artifact of some particular traffic routing model. It's actually something very fundamental, and it shows up in a lot of different guises. For example, in physical systems. So here's something you can do. Okay. You can take a bunch of springs and a bunch of strings, and you can tie them all together in a mechanical contraption. Okay, so you have a network of strings and springs. Now, you can attach one end of the network to the base, like the bottom of a table. Okay? And from the other end of the network, you can hang a weight, which just stretches everything out. Stretches out the strings, stretches out the springs. And if you build it just so, it's possible to take a pair of scissors and cut a taut string from the middle of the network, intuitively making this network only weaker, and yet that weight is going to levitate further off of the ground. And there's a couple ways to see that. One is just by analogy. What's happening here is exactly the same as what was happening in Brace's paradox. The X's in our traffic network correspond to the elastic springs. The ones and the zeros in our networks correspond to the inelastic strings. 
and the distance between the top and bottom of the contraption corresponds to the commute time. So in severing the tot string, we are nothing, doing nothing more than removing the teleporter from the second network to recover the superior equilibrium in the original network. From this picture, you might also be able to see a direct physical explanation of what's going on, which is when you cut that taut string, it frees up the two springs to carry the weight in parallel rather than in series. And for that reason, the force exerted on them is only half as much, they're only half as long, and that overall results in a levitation of the weight. This is not just a theoretical phenomenon. This can be realized. You can build these networks and actually demonstrate the levitation. At some point, I wanted there to be video demonstrations of this available on YouTube. So what do you think I did? Do you think I built one myself? Nah. I signed it for extra credit in my graduate course. <laughs> so if you search for Brace's Paradox on YouTube, you will now see the fruits of their labor. Okay. All right. So let's take stock of where we are. We've talked about this routing network. We've talked about the price of anarchy. We've seen two examples. Pigou's example and Brace's paradox, both cases the price of anarchy happens to be 4 over 3. So one piece of advice I like to give my graduate students is always think about what is the coolest thing which might be true given what you know. The coolest thing you haven't yet falsified. Okay? So you know, if you're just being naive and you sort of looked at these two examples and you saw 4 over 3 in both, you might hope or pray that as you look at more complicated, interesting networks, the price of anarchy remains small, close to one. That selfish behavior remains relatively benign. Okay? This, of course, is a somewhat bold conjecture because networks can get much bigger and much more complicated than Brace's paradox and Pigou's example. Okay? So despite the naivete of that conjecture, it turns out to actually be true. So you can consider any network whatsoever, as big and complicated as you like, even with multiple origins and multiple destinations. It is important that all of the cost functions have the form AX plus B, where A and B are non-negative. So these are called affine cost functions. That generalizes the zeros and Xs and ones we were seeing in the examples. But if you have affine cost functions, it does not matter how big and complicated the network is, the price of anarchy is never bigger than 4 over 3. Pigou's example embraces paradox, that's as big as it can be. So while unsurprisingly, the outcome of selfish behavior is not optimal, is not what we might want from a societal perspective, in these networks, it's perhaps surprisingly not that much worse. Never more, the average travel time is never more than 33% higher at equilibrium than in a centrally uh, optimized routing of the traffic. So I wasn't going to prove this theorem. Uh, in my opinion, subjecting any audience to a proof after the hour of 6 o'clock is vulgar. <laughs> so let me instead offer you kind of a, a sort of pseudo-argument by analogy. And the analogy is going to be with electrical current and electrical networks, so networks of resistors, something perhaps you studied in physics class when you were a kid. So it turns out electrical current and networks of resistors is actually a special case of this routing model. It's the special case where all of the Bs, all of the constant terms, are equal to zero. So it's a network where you might have x over here, 2x over here, and 4x over here. And the 1 and the 2 and the 4, those correspond to the resistances of those particular resistors. Okay? So what do we know about electrical current? Well, we know a lot of things. So one thing we know is that electrical current can be regarded as an equilibrium. It equalizes the voltage drop across all paths between the two terminals. But there's also Thompson's principle, which tells us that electrical current solves a natural optimization problem. It minimizes the dissipated energy, which actually in this case is equivalent to the objective we care about, the average travel time. So what we know about electrical current actually implies that when all the Bs are zero, the price of anarchy equals one. There is actually no harm whatsoever from selfish behavior. Now when the Bs are not zero, we already know the price of anarchy can grow larger, can be bigger than one, but we might hope that it doesn't break things too badly. And indeed, it's still the case that traffic equilibria in the general model are not just equilibria, but are also solutions to a particular optimization problem. 
They still minimize a suitable energy function. It's just that that energy function isn't exactly the function we care about, the average travel time. But when the cost functions are affine, or more generally not too nonlinear, it turns out those functions are pretty close, the one that they minimize and the one that we wished that they minimize. So equilibria, by virtue of exactly optimizing the approximately correct function, are then approximately optimal for the function we actually care about, the average travel time. So morally, that's what's going on in this theorem, and that's why this is true. Okay, so that brings us, brings me to the end of the first case study. Uh, before I go to the second case study, bear with me while I digress for a couple minutes. So on this slide is a question that was driving me crazy when I was a graduate student. So I was paranoid that in some 40-year-old dusty journal article, I was going to find this result, which was supposed to be one of the central results of my thesis. So I still haven't found such an article, but still, to mitigate my paranoia, I felt compelled to come up with a story, a narrative, of why it might be that no one would have proven this theorem in the 20th century. Again, the model is almost 100 years old. For example, someone in economics or transportation science. So, who knows, but the best story I've come up with involves something known as NP-completeness, and that's a concept also crucial for our second and third case studies. So let me tell you a little bit about it, NP-completeness. Actually, first let's talk about maps. So as you know, when you see a map of a continent, <laughs> like Europe, uh, the countries will be color-coded, red, green, blue, etc. And whenever two countries share a border, they have different colors, because you want it to be visually easy to know where one ends and the other begins. So back in the days when you could actually make a living printing maps, a very relevant question was exactly how many different types of ink are going to be required, because that corresponded to production cost. So that is, how many colors are required to give every country a color so the countries sharing a border have different colors? So we can ask this question, for example, about these particular nine European countries. How many colors do we need to avoid any conflicts? Certainly one color is not good enough. What about two colors? Do you think you could color each of these countries red or blue so that adjacent countries always have different colors? You can't, and this is not too hard to see. For example, you can consider Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic, and notice that each of those countries borders both of the other two. So that's going to force all of them to get a distinct color. You can't reuse a color amongst those three countries. So a more interesting question is, what about three colors? Do you think you could color these nine countries red, green, and blue, so that whenever two countries are adjacent, share a border, they get different colors? I'll let you think about that for a few seconds. It's kind of a tricky one. Here's a hint. Look at Austria and the countries that border it. Every country in this picture, oops, we did that. Every country in this picture outside of Poland borders Austria. So those seven countries form a ring around Austria. I claim that we're going to need three distinct colors just to color those seven countries in the ring around Austria. And it's important that there are seven countries rather than six or eight. If there is an even number of countries in the ring, we could alternate red and blue and avoid any conflicts. But with an odd number, like seven, you need three colors to avoid all of the conflicts. Okay? So three colors for the ring. Now back to Austria which borders every one of those seven countries and must get a distinct color from any of them. So that's a fourth color. 
that's required. So you cannot do three colors, although it's tricky to see why. You can color it in four colors. To show you that, I just need to show you the coloring, and here it is. In fact, there's a famous result known as the four-color theorem, which says that any map you can actually color in four colors, okay? including this one. All right, so what I want to ask next is, so consider this map coloring problem. Is this something we could solve automatically by computer? Okay, so I give you a map, and I want to know whether or not you can color it in three colors. Can we solve that by computer, or is it one of the undecidable problems that Turing identified back in 1936? Well, if you think about it a little while, you realize, okay, no, this is definitely not an undecidable problem. You definitely, in principle, could solve the map coloring problem using an algorithm, okay, using a computer. And the reason is because, if nothing else, you could just do exhaustive search through all of the possibilities. So, for example, with these nine countries, there's three colors to try, red, green, or blue, for each of the nine countries. You could try all three raised to the ninth power options, check if any of them work. If one of them works, you're done, you know three colors suffice. If none of them work, you're assured that at least four colors are needed. So you can definitely solve, in principle, the map coloring problem. But how should we feel about this exhaustive search algorithm? Well, if you only have nine countries, there's only three to the ninth power possibilities, which is about 20,000, which a computer can easily enumerate instantaneously. In the whole world, on the other hand, there's closer to 200 countries. And then the number of options is going to be three raised to the 200th power. And that's a big number, a really big number. In fact, significantly bigger than the estimated number of atoms in the known universe. Okay? So while in principle a computer could enumerate all of those possibilities, that program would not halt an hour or anybody else's lifetime. So the concern with map coloring is not so much that it's unsolvable, but rather that it's unsolvable in a reasonable amount of time, unsolvable by using uh, any fast algorithm. So that brings me to the theory of NP-completeness, which was developed on either side of the Iron Curtain in parallel in the early 70s by Cook, Karp, and Levin. And you can think of NP-completeness as a refinement of Turing's theory, which is meant to identify problems which, while not unsolvable, are solvable by exhaustive search, but are unsolvable quickly. Unsolvable, so it's always going to solve the problem in our lifetime. Okay? That's what NP-completeness means. And there's three things I want you to know about it. So that's the first one. When someone says a problem is NP-complete, it's bad news. It means we do not expect there to be an always fast, always correct algorithm for that problem. I say there, do, it, you know, there doesn't seem to be a fast algorithm, because that interpretation actually rests on an unproven mathematical conjecture known as the P not equal to NP conjecture. And that's a conjecture that asserts something that just feels very true, you know, especially to anyone who's a student. It says if you look at two tasks, the task of the student that actually has to complete a homework assignment, and the task of the teaching assistant that merely has to grade that student's solution, P not equal to NP says that the student has it harder than the grader. The student has a more difficult task than the one who just has to check the student's work. So it sounds intuitive enough, but this actually hasn't been proved, but we sort of regard it as a law of nature in computer science, that P not equal to NP. And if that's true, then there are no general purpose fast algorithms for any NP complete problems. So again, it's bad news when your problem is NP complete. Second thing I want you to know is that NP-completeness is everywhere. There are literally thousands of problems we would love to solve quickly, but it seems that we can't because they are NP-complete. Map coloring is one example, but there's lots of others. Even just trying to figure out the best way to pack your suitcase for a trip, it's already an NP-complete problem, including many of the kinds of resource allocation problems we'd like to solve, scheduling classrooms, et cetera. All these problems are NP-complete and do not seem to have always fast, always correct algorithms. The third thing, the final thing I want you to know about NP-completeness is that my field, theoretical computer science, has grown up its whole life in the long shadow cast by NP-completeness. So we in my field have known that we're almost never going to get what we want. We can almost never efficiently solve problems that we care about. So, you know, to earn a living, 
we had to figure out, you know, ways of coping with this ubiquitous computational intractability. And so we have a toolbox for dealing with NP-complete problems. And one of the main things that we use is heuristic algorithms. Okay, so algorithms that are fast, but not necessarily always correct. Like for map coloring, you could imagine a heuristic algorithm that never needs more than four colors, but sometimes it will use four when you, in principle, could have gotten away with three. And the main way that we assess the quality of heuristic algorithms is by quantifying how far away they are from always being optimal. So it's not going to always be optimal, but maybe it's always approximately optimal. So that idea of an approximation guarantee, which is so ingrained in the mind of any theoretical computer science scientist, is exactly what we're using to talk about the price of anarchy. Okay? So it's a totally different context. We're not speaking about fast heuristic algorithms. We're speaking about equilibria of games, but it's exactly the same formalism of an approximation guarantee. And that is my best story for why the four-thirds theorem was never proved in the 20th century. It was really the kind of question that it seems that only a computer scientist would ask. The second case study is going to be on something very real, very practical. A huge auction which, uh, that was run in the U.S. involving tens of billions of dollars that ended earlier this year, and where computer science played an absolutely crucial role. So this story begins a little over five years ago. That's when the U.S. government authorized the development of a novel kind of auction. And it was an auction for selling licenses for wireless spectrum, presumably to telecom companies. In the U.S., they'd be companies like AT&T, Sprint, or T-Mobile. Now, that wasn't a new idea. It turns out the U.S., the U.K., and many other countries have been running auctions with spectrum licenses, you know, for about 20 years at this point. So what was different this decade and why a new auction was needed is that the licenses that they really wanted to sell were unfortunately already held by other people. Okay, there was no just free spectrum to auction off. And, the, and the, the furthermore, the people who held those licenses in general were not getting a whole lot of value from them for the most part. They were principally mom and pop, over the air television broadcasters broadcasting on channel 49 or what have you, which frankly, if they went poof overnight, it's not clear that anyone would really notice. Okay? So the goal of this auction was actually to repurpose spectrum from low value use over the air television broadcasting to high value use next generation wireless applications. So the auction, which uh, ran for quite a while, it started in March of 2016 and it ended in March of 2017, so it was a pretty long auction, uh, and so it really has, it's really what's called a double auction. And there's both buying and selling going on. And they happen in phases. The first phase, the reverse auction, that's the buying phase. So at this point, the government is buying back licenses, paying off television broadcasters to reclaim their licenses. This is the part of the auction that had literally never been done before. Totally new design run for the first time. Then, once they acquired these licenses, now they could use a forward auction, like the ones they've been running for 20 years, uh, to sell those to the highest bidder. Okay? Now, the dust has settled, the auction ended, so we can see how it did, and you can see that the numbers involved are pretty big. The government spent about $10 billion buying back licenses from the television broadcasters in the reverse auction, uh, but then it managed to flip those auctions for $20 billion, clearing $10 billion. So even after covering the auction's costs and a few other details, this made a tremendous amount of money, and the U.S. government applied it to reduce the deficit, which was part of the plan all along, which is probably one of the reasons why the bill didn't have much trouble passing a very partisan Congress in 2012. Of course, it could be another reason, was the very clever name of the bill, which they decided should be the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. <laughs> I dare any politician to vote against that. <laughs> All right, so these are big numbers, tens of billions of dollars. And to make this endeavor even more stressful, it's actually really easy to screw up a spectrum auction. And debacles have happened. One cautionary tale is provided by New Zealand back in 1990. This is before governments really had much experience with auctions. Uh, 
So the New Zealand government just wanted to open up uh, 10 new nationwide television channels. Okay, so you just broadcast on TV anywhere in the country. So they had 10 licenses to sell, one per channel, and they're basically interchangeable. And for reasons that are still opaque to me, uh, they decided to use an auction, fine, but the auction format they decided on was to run in parallel at the same time a separate second price auction for each of the 10 licenses. So what's a second price auction, also called a Vickery auction? Well, actually, it's something that's a really good idea if you're only selling one thing, and it's basically equivalent to what you see on eBay or what you'd see at an art auction down at Christie's. So people bid on whatever you're selling. The highest bidder is the winner, and the highest bidder pays the highest bid by somebody else, the highest bid by a competitor, which is going to be the second highest bid overall. And if you've ever won an item on eBay, you know this is how it works. Usually you don't have to pay the maximum you're willing to pay, you just pay high enough to beat out everybody else. So that leads to the second price auction. With one item, this has a very cool property that as a bidder, there's no reason to sort of, you know, craft, you know, some clever strategy. You may as well just bid your maximum willingness to pay. That's actually a dominant strategy when you're just selling one item. When you're selling 10 things in parallel with these different second price auctions, you do not have that property. In fact, you know, put yourself in the shoes of somebody bidding in this auction. Okay, there's these 10 licenses, you only want one of them. You can submit up to 10 numbers, one in each auction. What should you do? It's not so clear. One reasonable strategy, pick your favorite channel, Lucky Channel 7, and go all in. Just bid your maximum willingness to pay. Another very defensible strategy, especially if you think it might not be a very competitive auction, would be to go bargain hunting and just bid really low on lots of different channels, hoping you get one for a very cheap price. And a good rule of thumb is that whenever you have an auction where it's highly unclear what the participants should do, it's probably an auction vulnerable to extremely poor outcomes. And that was the case in New Zealand. The government was hoping to raise a quarter billion dollars from this auction. That would be 25 million per channel. Didn't quite work out that way. They got not even 15% of that, 36 million. To add insult to injury, in the interest of transparency, the government was required to report not only the selling price, which remember is the second highest bid, but also the winning bid, making it obvious to everybody exactly how much money was left on the table. And if you delve into these numbers, you can find some pretty cringe-inducing things. One channel, the high bid, was 500,000. And you already know that's big, big trouble. They're hoping to make 25 million per channel. I'm telling you the high bid was 500,000. The second highest bid, and therefore the selling price, six. Not 6,000, <laughs> six. Someone literally got a nationwide license for six bucks in this auction, okay? So, it's a stressful thing, designing these spectrum auctions. So let's see what they came up with for this reverse auction, this new huge auction they had to run for the first time. So the auction format was uh, proposed by a couple of economist colleagues of mine at Stanford, Paul Milgram and Ilya Segal, and the, this format can be thought of as an extension of previous formats in both the game theory and computer science literatures. And um, what's really cool about this auction format, called the descending clock auction, is that it's really, really easy for the participants, okay? So if you're a participant in this auction, meaning you're a television station, you have a license, and you might be willing to sell it to the government for a high enough price. So if you're still in this auction, here's what happens. The auction runs in rounds, and in a given round, you'll be asked a question of the form, would you or would you not be willing to sell your license for, say, $1 million? You can say whatever you want. You can say no. You say no, you get kicked out of the auction forever. What does that mean? That means you're guaranteed to keep your license and stay on the air. On the other hand, you won't be getting any compensation either. Or you can say yes, you would be willing to sell it 
for a million dollars. That doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to happen, because it might be that in the next round of the auction, you could ask the same question with a lower buyout price. Would you be willing to sell it for $950,000? And again, you can say no and be kicked out forever, or you can say yes and live to see another day. If you're still in the auction when it ends, then indeed the government will buy your license and they will pay you the most recent, which is also the lowest, buyout offer that you ever accepted. Okay? So that's how this auction works. If you're one of these participants, there's kind of an obvious thing you should do, which is to just figure out what is the lowest offer price you'd be willing to accept, stay in the auction, and then if the, offer, if the buyout price ever drops below your minimum acceptance price, drop out and keep your license. Okay, that's the intended behavior of participants in this auction. A little bit more about how it works. So really what this auction is striving to do is clear a target amount of spectrum, so some number of channels, okay, maybe 10 channels. And it's trying to clear this spectrum while paying as little as possible. Okay? So for example, you could target the stations currently broadcasting on channels 38 to 51, 14 different channels, and say, you know, I want to clear 10 of them. So maybe I'll leave people broadcasting on 38, thir uh, 39, 40, and 41, but I'll clear up the other 10 so I can sell them in the forward part of the auction. Okay, that's the type of clearing target that they were working with. Now, to make this a viable goal, it was important that the government was willing to use their power to reassign people's channels. So I told you that if you drop out of this auction, you would be guaranteed to retain your license and stay on the air. That is true, but you are not guaranteed to retain your channel assignment. Possibly you were broadcasting on channel 51 before the auction, but you're going to be reassigned to 41 after the auction. Okay? So really, the goal is to buy out enough stations so that if you look at the stations that remain on the air, it's possible to assign channels okay, so that none of them interfere with each other and so that you only use, say, four channels total. Here's the picture I want you to have in mind. So each circle here represents a station. The area of the circle represents its broadcast radius, and the color represents the channel. You'll notice that overlapping circles always have different colors. That's not an accident. Different stations with overlapping broadcast regions need to be assigned different channels to avoid interference. So three channels are currently in use, the yellow, the blue, and the brown channel. And you can see that there's no way you could keep all these stations on the air while assigning them to less than three channels. Because over here on the right, there are three mutually overlapping stations. So they're each going to need their own channel. On the other hand, imagine you bought out that blue station on the right, taking it off the air. If you look at what's left, you're like, okay, maybe that didn't help much. We're still using all three of the channels. But now, it's possible to reassign channels so that the brown channel is no longer used, and the brown channel could be sold in a forward auction. Okay? So that's what this auction has to keep track of. Okay? The stations that stay on the air, need, sh it should be possible to assign them channels, or colors if you like, so that you use a small number of channels or small number of colors, and without any interference. So I hope this looks a little familiar to all of you. We were talking about this exact problem 15 minutes ago. This is exactly the map coloring problem. Okay? And we talked about how the map coloring problem is NP-complete, and we talked about how NP-complete problems do not seem to have fast algorithms. So you should have a question in your mind, which is how on earth did this auction happen if it had to solve this NP-complete problem okay, quickly? So let me tell you a little bit about that. It wasn't easy. It was a major engineering effort, and so it was uh, done by computer scientists, a team led by Kevin Layton Brown at the University of British Columbia. And so uh, their approach was the following. Okay, so they took these map coloring problems that they were charged with solving, and they re-encoded them as a different kind of NP-complete problem. It's something known as the satisfiability problem, or SAT. And that's a problem where you're given a big old logical formula with a bunch of Boolean variables in it, and you, the question is, can you assign the Boolean variables to true or false? 
so that you make this big Boolean formula true. Okay, that's the SAT problem. So they said, forget about this coloring. Let's just encode it as a, as a SAT problem. Why do that? Because SAT is a really well-studied problem. Okay? Hundreds of people for decades have been working hard to get better and better heuristic algorithms for satisfiability. But it turned out even the state of the art wasn't quite good enough for the performance they needed. They wanted to solve SAT, form, SAT problems with tens of thousands of variables, hundreds of thousands of constraints, so decent sized satisfiability problems. They wanted to do it in seconds. Okay? And that's pretty ambitious. So the state of the art general purpose algorithms were not good enough for them. So what they did is something that we usually do for NP-complete problems when we actually really need to solve them, is we build in our domain knowledge. We stop trying to solve everything fast, and we focus on the instances that we care about. And in these particular coloring problems, there's a lot you know in advance. You know who the stations are, and you know what their broadcasting regions are, so you know what all these interference constraints are like. And so Leighton Brown's team, they basically baked in some of this advanced knowledge, domain knowledge, into the state-of-the-art algorithms, and with that combination, they were able to get the performance they needed, solving almost all of the uh, recoloring problems they cared about in a matter of just a few seconds. Okay, so a very important, uh, impressive feat of engineering. And I hope you kind of see the higher-level point that I'm trying to get at. Right, so it turned out that state-of-the-art techniques in computer science for dealing with NP-complete problems were not only sufficient, but also necessary for this auction to be a viable format. If it wasn't for these techniques coming from computer science, the US government literally would have run a different auction. They could not have run the auction that they actually run. Okay? So computer science was really essential uh, to this auction. All right, so let me move on to the third case study, which will be much quicker than the first two. This you can think of as a face-off of sorts between Nash and Turing. We're going to apply the computational lens squarely to the Nash equilibrium concept. Let me remind you what Nash's theorem says. Remember, this is the universal guaranteed existence. Any game, any strategic situation, doesn't matter how many players or what they want, there's always going to be at least one Nash equilibrium. And we talked about how you know, this sort of gave anyone who uses game theory everything that they might want. Okay? Guaranteed universal existence with no assumptions. But actually, sometimes maybe you do want something else. If you look at many of the ways that people interpret a Nash equilibrium, many of the reasons to care about Nash equilibria, they fundamentally involve someone, maybe the players themselves, maybe some trusted third party, a mediator or a designer, but somebody, some boundedly rational actor, has to figure out what people are going to play, has to figure out what an equilibrium is. So it'd be nice if Nash's theorem not just gave us this abstract promise of the existence of an equilibrium, but gave us a principled way to actually figure one out, to compute an equilibrium efficiently. So if you look at the proof of Nash's theorem, it's based on something known as Brouwer's fixed point theorem, and it really offers no help. It does not lead to an efficient version of Nash's theorem. It doesn't help you quickly compute an equilibrium. So this is an important question. It's been open for a long time. And nobody knows any constructive or efficient version of Nash's theorem. Which, of course, makes you wonder, you know, maybe one doesn't exist. So if you thought one doesn't exist, how would you prove it? Well, remember we were talking about NP-complete problems and that they don't seem to have fast algorithms and that there's thousands of them. So the simplest explanation would seem to be that computing a Nash equilibrium is yet another one of these thousands of NP-complete problems. That turns out to actually not be true. It doesn't seem to be true. Uh, so Nimrod Megiddo pointed out that there's sort of a type-checking error between NP-complete problems and the problem of computing a Nash equilibrium. NP-complete problems are fundamentally yes-no questions, like I give you a map, can it or can it not be colored using three colors? Other NP-complete problems are also yes-no questions in the same way. But the problem of computing a Nash equilibrium, what's the yes-no question? We're not asking, does a Nash equilibrium exist? We know it does. That's exactly what Nash's theorem tells us. So somehow the difficulty seems to stem merely 
from getting our grubby little hands on one of these equilibria that we know perfectly well is out there. So that's sort of a type checking error. So what do we do if we can't prove that the problem's NP complete? Well, just like we refined Turing's theory of undecidability to NP completeness to speak about problems solvable by exhaustive search, I guess what we need to do is refine the theory of NP completeness further so that we can talk about these equilibrium computation problems. So that was a research program proposed by uh, Christos Papadimitriou. And he said, we shouldn't be trying to prove that the, the computing in Nash equilibrium is NP complete. We should be trying to prove that it's a, a weaker intractability statement uh, known as PPAD complete. You might be wondering, like, what, what is this alphabet soup? What does PPAD stand for? Well, allegedly, allegedly, it stands for polynomial parity argument directed version. <laughs> Christos told me he had no idea that these four letters were a substring of the first five letters of his last name. <laughs> but if you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. So it was a very prescient suggestion to, that, that we should prove that the computing a Nash equilibrium is intractable through this mechanism of PPAD completeness. It took more than 10 years. It took some really deep, difficult proofs, but it has been proved last decade. Okay, so Das Galakis, Goldberg, Papanichu, Chen Den, Den and Tang, a consequence of their work is that indeed, computing a Nash equilibrium is hard in this sense, PPAD complete. And what is the interpretation? The interpretation is under an analog of the P not equal to NP conjecture. We do not expect to ever see a fast algorithm for computing a Nash equilibrium. There, there cannot be a constructive or efficient version of Nash's theorem that shares the same universal sweep. Okay? So if you only care about existence, you can always get what you want. But if you also care about efficient computation, you can't. Of course, you can, play all of the, you can apply the same toolbox we apply for NP-complete problems, like baking in domain knowledge and finding an algorithm that works not in general, but just for an interesting class of games, but you cannot get the universal sweep of Nash's theorem in a constructive way. So, to wrap up, computer science and game theory as fields, they evolved pretty much totally independently over the 20th century. Very little communication between the two. But things have been very different this century. There's been lots of productive exchange of ideas. I've shown you a few examples. There are many, many others. Entire conferences are devoted to the interface of these two fields these days. And I want to emphasize that the flow of information, the flow of ideas, really goes in both directions. The original reason why computer scientists started studying game theory and economics is because we needed to. We needed their techniques for the applications that we cared about. I mentioned the case of routing in the internet. Another huge example I didn't mention is the design of real-time auctions for online advertising, which is like by far the biggest part of a business model of a, co of a company like Google or Facebook. Okay, also a combination of computer science and economic <laughs> techniques. A uh, much more, ro a more recent example would be the cryptocurrency space, where it's becoming increasingly clear that computer scientists working in that domain need to think very carefully about the incentive issues that they're baking into their protocols. But increasingly, the influence is also going in the opposite direction, with computer science having an impact in economic theory and practice. All of the case studies you saw today illustrate this point. So in the routing example, the use of approximation guarantees to prove novel positive results in a model that was almost 100 years old. In the second case study with the auctions, the fact that the computer science toolbox for coping with NP-complete problems was absolutely essential for the practical viability of this auction, which generated tens of billions of dollars. And in the third case study, how computer science theory allows us to prove in a formal sense why there has never been a constructive or efficient version of Nash's theorem. But beyond all of this, if you take one thing away from this talk, I hope it's a sense of the excitement that the research that is happening at the interface of computer science and game theory. I'm quite confident that the next 15 years will be just as fun as the last 15. So, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Tim, for, for a great lecture. I think we're all 
they're all excited and pumped up now. So I hope there's lots of questions. Um, when you uh, want to ask a question, please raise your hand. I think there's some microphones that are going to circulate and for the purposes of the recording and so that others can hear, uh, please do use the microphone. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, I think you're behind the time. The, the um, proper model of computation should be something called MRAMs. The Turing machines are too weak. It's the Hartmann Simon MRAM. For MRAMs, uh, P is equal to NP. Guessing doesn't help. Every problem is hard. And no problem is better than the outside of NP are two regular expressions equivalent. Um, I'm not sure why the Hartmannus work is ignored. Okay, let's take another. Let's take questions in threes, perhaps. Um, there's a question here. Thank you. That's we, we, sorry, wait, wait, we got the, uh, there, thanks. You made the distinction to some extent, uh, non zero sum, zero sum games. One man who did a lot of work, I don't know he's still alive, Professor Anna Rappaport, who tried to apply this to um, political question disarmament. Could you, you know, say about Rappaport's work if he's still influenced? Uh, Davenport, okay. Another question? Rappaport, right? Yeah. Anatole Rappaport, yeah. yeah. He's still alive, he's still alive, right? Yeah. That's a good question, I don't know. Do you want to take both those questions? So the MRAMs and the... Sure, yeah. So let me, let me, let me do the, the second one first. Um, right, so perhaps the work you're speaking of is work on the repeater, repeated prisoner's dilemma, um, which, you know, so the prisoner's dilemma is actually maybe the most famous example of a game which I didn't actually put in my talk. Um, so it's a situation where you have two players. They can either cooperate or not cooperate. And what the prisoner's dilemma illustrates is kind of this complete conflict between what's good for the individual and what's good for the collective. So each individual has an incentive to not cooperate, but they're both better off if they do cooperate. And actually, once you study some game theory, you start seeing, among other things, the prisoner's dilemma everywhere. Uh, and indeed, like in the Cold War, it was uh, you know, popular with von Neumann and other advisors as far as thinking about the theory of mutually assured destruction. Um, so, you know, it didn't show up in my talk today, but you know, when I teach undergraduates about incentives in computer science, one of the main things I tell them about is uh, prisoner's dilemma. I talk about you know, tournaments of different prisoner's dilemma algorithms and the tit-for-tat strategy, but most importantly, I teach them to recognize it in the real world. Uh, so for, the, for the, second, uh, the first question, maybe I'll make a more general comment. So, um, so I was uh, in, you know, I, I deliberately did not make precise what my model of computation was uh, in the talk, other than mentioning uh, Turing's Turing machine model, which he introduced in his uh, 1936 paper. And you know, of course, when you talk about what computers can do, it does you know it can change as you change your notion of computation. Um, so at least you know as far as the you know mainstream computer science, um, for the types of issues I was talking about in my talk, it doesn't actually matter exactly which of the mainstream models of computation you use. They're all equivalent in the sense that each can simulate the other one with reasonable overhead. So if you prove that you can't solve map coloring in, one, in Turing's model of computation, the other sort of standard models of computation uh, that one looks like, you also cannot solve it. Now there are other changes to the computational model which can matter, so like quantum computing is something which is sort of very unclear at the moment. We know quantum computing algorithms for factoring efficiently, we do not know classical algorithms, we don't really understand how much more powerful quantum algorithms are. So I was unfamiliar with the particular model uh, that was proposed, but indeed, you know, if you change the model, especially if you change it radically, um, then you know, it, can, you know, it can change the results. But again, what I talked about today, um, for all of the mainstream models of computation, everything I said would, be the, would, be, would still be correct. Okay, thank you. More questions? Uh, right upstairs, if we, do we have anybody upstairs with the microphone? No. Okay, can you shout? Uh, yeah, yeah. with increasing oh thank you uh, with increasing power uh, then surely N NP complete problems would seem to be a problem of the past in the very near future 
and surely we could use something like perturbation theory uh, in a similar way. Uh, what do you think of this? It's a massive parallelism. Yeah, so it's, um, it's uh, that's a good question. Actually, first let me just say how cool it is that there's a balcony. <laughs> <laughs> I give talks in big rooms sometimes, but there's almost never a balcony, so that's pretty, pretty neat. Um, so the question uh, was about what if you can do computation in parallel, okay? So let me sort of answer a version of that question which was not the one asked just initially. So the first thing you might think about is like, okay, well, what if you use computer chips not with one core but with 32 cores or 64 cores? So, you know, you can get a speed up, but the speed up's gonna be by a factor of 32 or 64, or however many processors you're throwing at the problem. And remember the numbers we were talking about. We were talking about three raised to the 200th power, okay? That is still a really, really big number if you divide it by 64, or any other kind of you know, physically imaginable quantity. So that was not the question, though. The question was about uh, quantum computing, uh, which in at least some restricted sense does seem to be able to search an exponential number of possibilities uh, quickly. Um, but so this is, this is something that's not obvious, but you know, has been proven uh, in the theoretical computer science literature, which is we do not expect quantum computers to be able to solve NP-complete problems. That would violate the sort of complexity universe as we currently understand it. And again, so that requires a proof. Um, so they can do these kinds of exponential style computations, but somehow they're so restricted they won't let you color maps uh, or something like that. Now there's no contradiction with what I talked about with factoring, because factoring is one of these interesting problems where on the one hand, we don't know an efficient, i.e. polynomial time algorithm, but on the other, it's also not NP-complete. And actually we think it will never be NP-complete because there's a good quantum algorithm for the problem. It's a good question. Okay, thanks. Gentleman here. Thanks. <coughs> thanks for the presentation. On the matter of um, color mapping, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious as to what your best time solving a, a Rubik cube is. But more seriously, um, you know, today the Bitcoin hit eleven thousand dollars, and you mentioned game theory in terms of cryptocurrency. Yep. I mean, what is game theory must enter into that. I'm, I'm curious as to what you think mo is happening. Sure. And lastly, if, if regarding Californian traffic flow, can, is there a very plausible possibility that within, say, 10 years, with automated um, driverless cars, um, flow the, say, six, six lanes of traffic, people will, each vehicle will move at an optimal speed and everyone will get, get to their destination much quicker. Using al algorithms, of course. <laughs> uh, good, so let me take them one at a time. So, so right, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, um, I think this is a very exciting space. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff we don't understand. And I think you know, computer science and game theory and economics are all gonna be very relevant for understanding this better. There's questions at, at sort of very different scales. So one scale would just be, and actually I went to a talk, a public lecture on this on Tuesday, um, which is just, you know, how, you know, what is the right economic model for, you know, a virtual currency? You know, is it like something which, you know, is based on the gold standard or is it sort of like the kind of, you know, money just that's merely in the books, you know, at corporate banks or how should we think about it? So th I think that's a great thing for economists to be thinking about. It's a little bit further from, uh, the expertise of most computer scientists, but obviously that's very important. What I think is in sort of the computer science wheelhouse is thinking about specific protocols, like specifically the Bitcoin blockchain protocol, and trying to understand, you know, what are the incentive issues just, you know, within this system. And um, there's been, so, so basically, so again, our understanding is very primitive. There have been some important observations um, about why, in, you know, the incentives in Bitcoin are not quite what they were what you'd like them to be and what it was suggested they would be in Satoshi's original uh, white paper. The most famous example is, is something known as selfish, uh, selfish mining, which came out of Cornell, um, Eyal and Gun Sarir. And so um, basically they invented a new type of attack, which it seemed had not been you know, in Satoshi's mind when he wrote the, the white paper. So you know, the original claim of the sort of incentive properties of Bitcoin is basically if you, cont if you control less than 50% of the total comp computing power, then you should just follow the protocol honestly. You should just behave the protocol as is intended. And it's actually not quite right. So 
Um, this work out of Cornell identified that even if you have somewhat less than 50%, you still need a lot, but even if you need somewhat less than 50%, actually there are ways of deviating from the protocol which can be beneficial to you. And so just briefly, the nature of the TAC is, you know, if you find a block, so you successfully authorize a block of transactions, and you're now in a position to add it to the blockchain, what you do is you actually don't add it to the blockchain. You kind of hide it under your jacket. And now the trick is, the only way you can extend the blockchain is by mining the previous block on the blockchain. So you have to solve an intractable problem, basically inverting a one-way function that references the previous block in the blockchain. So if you're hiding what's going to be the next block in the blockchain, you're preventing everybody else from extending it further. Now, it's gambling because someone else might find the block themselves and extend the blockchain, and then that nullifies yours. But if you find a second block before anyone else does, boom, you can put them both on the blockchain and be better off than you were before. So this is selfish mining, and that's just an example which shows that you know, Bitcoin is in some sense not incentive compatible. We have no idea how to reason about, you know, what is the design space of cryptocurrencies? And, you know, is there some point in this design space which is sort of robustly incentive compatible in some sense? This is something where it sort of urgently needs people, people to work on. I think that was only question one. Was there a second question? Traffic in California. <laughs> I'm not counting vehicles. that Algorithms oh, the the vehicles. Oh, okay, so self-driving cars, right. Um, you know, I mean, I think a, a lot of, I mean, technologically, I mean, yes, that is the vision. You know, the vision um, is especially, you know, especially if it was literally 100%, you know, opting in to self-driving cars, that you'd optimize the fleets uh, together. And so in principle, they could drive at very high speeds, very close to each other, um, et cetera. Obviously, politics are going to play a very important role of how this rolls out. Um, but I think, you know, at least in either some states or some countries, um, I think, yeah, we may see kind of fully autonomous fleets of vehicles driving very quickly, very close together, pretty soon. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Some microphone distribution algorithm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, about the traffic flow question, I, in your examples, your cost function was linear. M my guess is that when you make that non-linear, it changes very differently. I wonder if you can talk a bit about that and how it, what, what, uh, what results you might see from that. Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that. Those are literally the last two slides that I cut from the <coughs> talk. So, um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, you do, the affine assumption is quite important for the four thirds. It's still with any concave function, you're fine with the four thirds, but if it goes the other direction, if it's a quadratic function or cubic function, then the, the um, equilibrium degrades, the price of energy goes up. And it is understood precisely exactly how rapidly it goes up with the degree of nonlinearity of the cost function. The good news is that the cost functions have to be pretty nonlinear before it grows very large. And the, the way you prove this is actually sort of an interesting qualitative result. So, one way you can interpret that four-thirds theorem is it's, it's a characterization of what the worst network is. So you can go hunting far and wide for all networks in the world, and if you have these affine cost functions, this is already the worst one, this dirt simple network with uh, just an S and a T and two parallel roads. And that statement is actually true completely generally. It doesn't matter what cost functions you care about, but the worst network with a given set of cost functions is going to be a network with just two nodes and two roads. So that reduction from complicated networks to trivial networks allows you to compute the analog of the four over three for whatever cost functions you care about. So that's how we know that actually it remains pretty close to one unless you have sort of very you know, high degree polynomial type, type cost functions. So. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? Yes, down that uh, front row. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Do traffic planners actually you think of Brass's paradox when they design roads, do you know that? They, they definitely, I mean, presumably it, it depends a little bit on the traffic plan planner, but um, <laughs> I'm told, you know, at least my secondhand information is that the best ones um, are aware of paradoxes like Brace's paradox. You can imagine many other versions, you know, where like, you know, so even just the idea of like, why would you kind of artificially slow down an en entrance ramp? 
you know, it sounds, you know, it seems like it's locally making things worse, but actually it makes the flow on the main road better. So, um, so what I'm told is there, you know, there are traffic simulators, and basically before you make any major change, like a new road or a new lane or make something one way, you simulate it just to make sure that you're not going to get some sort of nasty surprise. So I'm told the most sophisticated ones are, are aware that they, there can be unintended consequences of infrastructure improvements. Okay. Question here. Um, great shot at the back. Hello. So um, I read that the, fo the four colored map theorem, the proof were required a computational part as well. I was wondering if the proof for the four thirds worst network th um, theorem also required a computational part. And for an aspiring mathematician, what level of computer science would they need to know um, to solve these bigger and bigger, more complex problems in the future? Um, interesting question. So um, there is no computer necessary for the four thirds theorem. Actually, by now we have quite short proofs of the result. Um, even the original proof was maybe just like a couple pages. It wasn't, it wasn't too crazy. Um, so what level of computer science should a mathematician learn? Well, I think, you know, uh, you know, we're at a stage where I think everybody should learn basic programming. It's just kind of becoming part of what it means, I think, to be a, you know, educated citizen, at least, you know, if you're below a certain age. Um, <laughs> or not, even. Um, Beyond that, you know, I'd say it depends a little bit on the types of mathematics that you're interested in. Um, I mean, if you go in the more sort of discrete or algebraic direction, uh, there the connections to computer science are pretty strong. And it's likely you would really enjoy, say, an algorithms course um, or a course about the complexity theory that I alluded to. Uh, you know, if you're sort of more on like the analytic or topological side, that's a little more distant than what goes on in theoretical computer science. So. You know, but in some ways, my advice, my main advice would be, you know, see if you can find a great professor. You know, see if you can find someone who's just, you really enjoy going to their lectures. And, you know, maybe that sets you on that path, or maybe it sets you on a different path. But either way, that's the usual advice I give to, give to students, especially about math, so. Uh, and, and for your information, LSE has many great professors. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Back here. From a, uh, one, yeah, from a social science point of view, so let's say, did the Soviet Union have the wrong um, algorithms, or would they have done? Would they? Um, would their system have worked? Uh, the planned system would have worked better if they had uh, uh, better algorithms. Right. So I mean, this reminds me. So when I was first uh, speaking about this price of anarchy work. Um, there's definitely a, a, a certain subset of people um, very highly correlated with being Eastern European defectors in the West who were very excited about interpreting the results as saying, you know, the free market is, you know, not much worse than a, a centralized planned economy because um, they were really sort of on board with the, the Western economic ideas. Um, so I think, you know, the way to interpret this would say, you know, so a, as you point out, right, so if you want to have, you know, a centrally planned economy, I mean, there's, there's just like a lot of problems. There's a lot of diff challenges in even executing that. You know, you have to figure out your objective function. You have to figure out the design space. You have to have a good algorithm to solve your optimization problem accurately. And so what these theorems are basically saying, that what the four-thirds theorem, for example, says is that even ignoring all those problems, okay, so even if you had perfect information about who's going to use the network and what the network is and what the cost functions are, and even if you use a perfect algorithm for figuring out how to route them, even then, it's only 33% worse at an equilibrium. So, you know, the fact that it's, you're right, so you could easily imagine that the cost of trying to do a centralized implementation would far exceed the cost of that extra 33% delay. I mean, that's in some sense a decision for the policymaker, not for the work I'm doing, but that's kind of the trade-off that the theory offers. It's like you can do literally nothing, and this is what happens, or you can work really, really hard and you get this much better. And now it's sort of up to you to decide. Okay. Question here. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I will be very short. So do you see that uh, there is any new wave of quadratics model coming or we are at the end of 
Kondratiev's wave. So are we expecting a new the fifth waves to come or we are still going to be in the fourth one? I, I didn't quite catch that, I'm sorry. Kond Kondratiev's waves, like the Kondratiev wave of uh, kind of development and we are now in ICT wave, if you are familiar with that. So okay. with the AI and machine learning, so are we expecting to move to a more advanced uh, and more complex wave? That's what I'm trying to say. So it's a part-time shift in computing, I guess. Let's say it again. It's about part-time shifts, I suppose. Part-time shifts. Or part-time shifts. Paradigm yeah. shifts, yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's always hard to make predictions, um, especially about the future. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but... Uh, I mean, here's what's funny, right? I mean, so in some ways, we are definitely seeing a revolution right now with what machine learning is able to do and uh, speech translation and, you know, image you know, facial recognition, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, what's funny is that the shift that sort of we're observing, you know, <coughs> just on a day-to-day -day basis is not, is, you know, it's really a confluence of improvements in things we were already doing. So it's improvements in hardware, um, it's, you know, m sort of, it is improvements in algorithms, but not sort of paradigm shifts. It is improvements in the neural network architectures which are being used, but again, they're not radically different than what people are using in the 80s. So really, uh, so, I mean, in some ways, on the, on the intellectual side, what I'm saying is, I mean, I'm not even convinced, uh, I mean, I'm not seeing a paradigm shift in an intellectual sense right now. I am seeing it as far as the application and, and the technology. And so, you know, I, I think it's, so I think, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think even the things we already understand might lead to, you know, further leaps in, in technological ability in the years to come. Even more, you know, hopefully there's a lot more new radically, you know, new and cool ideas that we can think of as well. But even, you know, what we've got, I think shows a tremendous promise. Okay. Over here. Uh, about the FCC incentive auctions, um, uh, Paul Graham and, uh, and uh, Segal originally designed it to have many economics and uh, nice economic properties, but at the end, the actual design lose some of the nice property like incentive compatibility. Uh, but it, as you said, it still worked well. Uh, in contrast to other cases, like the in the New, New Zealand case, so can you comment on that? Sure. So, um, so the question was about the incentive compatibility of the FCC auction. So um, the reverse version, uh, you know, you, you do have to make some assumptions, but they're <coughs> relatively modest assumptions, and it actually is uh, incentive compatible in a strong sense. Again, just because participants interact with the auction through such a limited API, such a limited interface. They're literally just asking a sequence of yes-no questions for lower and lower prices. Now, you could worry about collusion, you know, which is illegal, but you might still be worried that people are kind of doing it behind the scenes. That reverse auction format of Milgram and Segal, it actually has, you know, some reasonable collusion proof uh, properties as well, which most auctions do not. Um, so that's the first thing. The reverse auction, I'm not so sure. I mean, so certainly there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of jockeying before the auction ever began. You know, like what are the, you know, what are the initial buyout prices with people wanting them to be higher or, so, you know, th I'm not saying people weren't strategizing it, but once that auction actually started, in the reverse auction, it wasn't, really wasn't clear how you would game it. It was not, a, not, a, not something they thought people could be able to do. And I'm, they haven't really made a lot public from the auction yet, but at least as of now, I'm unaware of any um, serious problems they had with people gaming the reverse auction. Now, the forward auction is a different story. Okay, so in the forward auction, you're absolutely right that it's not incentive compatible in any normal sense of the word. And they do worry about people gaming the system, and people do game it a little bit, but they just want it to have not too big an effect. And there's been some kind of epic fails in these forward auctions because of bad designs. Like one, one really nice one was, um, at one time, so, you know, a bunch of telecom companies figured out that they could basically collude without breaking the law by just implicitly colluding through what they would bid. So basically, you know, so basically if I really wanted license 148, you know, number 148 in Maryland, I would put a bid on, you know, I'd put a bid on it and I would say, you know, 10,148, which basically means, you know, I get this one and then you can take your favorite one. 
So it was a way that, you know, through the lower order bits of the bids, people were able to, you know, they were actually able to not compete with each other and therefore get super low prices. Of course, then they changed the auction format so that you had to bid in multiples of 10,000 to make it much more expensive to pull this off. But so, so the, for, you know, but again, to summarize, I think your point is extremely relevant for the forward auctions. Um, it's not super well understood, but they, they work pretty well. And so uh, to date, that's why, you know, they've survived, you know, they've evolved, but basically that forward auction format has not changed a whole lot in the last 20 years. And it's sort of because with the stakes involved, if it's not broke, you know, why fix it? But you're right that there are opportunities to game those forward auctions. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up there. It's eight o'clock, but thank you all very much for coming. That was a very inspirational talk, and we should all thank Tim for a, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks.